Welcome, welcome to this talk. A pint of your best, please, landlord. Um, pubs, of course. Uh, the, the British pub, it's been renowned the world over, but it actually didn't start here. It started as an Italian wine bar over 2000 years ago. Um, the Romans brought uh, roads and towns to Britain and with them the, something called a taberni in 43 AD. Um, this was a shop, a shop that sold not just not just wine, but other, other goods as well. And they put these taberni in towns and along the Roman roads. And this is to quench the thirst of the troops as they were passing along the way. However, um, people uh, in this country didn't drink wine. They drank ale. And uh, these owners of these taberni shops thought, well, why should we give the local people what they wanted? And they started to uh, adapt what they sold, and they sold ale in, in the shops. Um, now, ale was made without hops. It wasn't until the 14th century that hops was introduced, and it was when they used hops into beer that it became known as beer. By the 15th century, about almost all brewing uh, included the hops. And the name Taberni then was corrupted and it was known as tavern, so that's where we get the name tavern from. Now, taverns and alehouses, they served food and drink, um, but there were also inns because they included accommodation somewhere you could stay. And coaching inns were built along uh, the routes, co uh, the, the coaching routes for food, drink, accommodation and somewhere for horses to change. Now, this down this little lane, the old George Yard, just off the cloth market, is one of the oldest of the coaching inns in Newcastle. This is the, the old George. Here it is now. Um, it was a coaching inn with stables in the building on the right. You can see the building where it just says Anglo just above it. That was a stable. It was up on the first floor. So the coach would come down. Uh, you would get out. You would go into the old George and you'd have a meal, uh, you'd have the, uh, a drink, um, or you would have uh, just or even stay the night. And then the coach would continue on down through the archway in the middle of the picture, up a ramp, and the um, horses would be stabled there. Um, that I think the last time this was used as a stable was when they had a pantomime on at the Theatre Royal. They had Cinderella and had some of the ponies for Cinderella's coach uh, stabled there. Um, it was, was, there was an earlier pub on this site. This pub opened in 1690, but we think there was a pub on the site in the 16th century. Uh, and it was in this older pub that King Charles I visited here. While he was under house arrest in Newcastle, he was held in a big house on uh, what what is now Grey Street, um, which stood on the site of um, on the site of Lloyd's Bank, and he was held there. But he was allowed out. He went to Shieldfield to play golf, and uh, when he finished his game of golf, he came here to to have a drink. But he didn't care very much for the uh, drink that he was offered. And uh, there are letters in existence where he writes to London, say, can you send me up some of your lovely French wines? Because I don't really care for what, what's offered here in Newcastle. Um, it was altered in the 18th and 19th century. Um, in 1928, it was cleaned up and painted. So this is the old George as you as you can see, it's no longer stables to the right. It's used for other things. It was near to closure in 1928, um, but then they they did give it a good cleaning up and they even added proper toilets, which they didn't have before. Now, inside, there is something uh, which is related to Charles I, and that's this chair. This is a replica, a replica of uh, the chair which Charles I is supposedly to have sat in. Um, the original is still, is, is still in existence, but they made a copy. The brewers made a copy 
and they've placed it. So if you ever go into the old George, look for this chair. It's known as Charlie's chair. It's uh, supposed to be a, a copy of the chair which, uh, which he actually sat in. Now, another coaching in was this one, the Royal Turf Hotel. This was on Collingwood Street. Um, it's uh, built early 1800s. And this was the most um, popular coaching in of the time. There are about nine different coaching routes leading from the Royal Turf Hotel, going all over the country, London, Leeds, across to Carlisle, up to Edinburgh. Um, they would uh, they would be operated six days a week, Monday to Saturday, but they didn't just take people, they also took goods. So if you wanted to send a parcel to your auntie who lived in Edinburgh, for example, uh, you could just bring it down here and then it could be put on the on the coach and they could pick it up when it got to its destination. If you missed the Saturday coach, then you could leave it and it would be placed in a little room in the uh, the turf hotel by the way it's called turf hotel because the owner um used to be clerk of the races at uh, newcastle races and i don't mean up at gossip park this is when the races used to be on the on the town moor he uh he used to live at the grandstand or on the town moor his name was loftus and this is where he lived uh on the town moor so that's the reason why it's called the Tur turf hotel there is a story of, of a couple of stories about goods that are left in a small room. On a Monday morning, they came to uh, put all of the parcels that had been left over the weekend. And there was a rather peculiar smell. So they had a look and they found a long, thin box. And inside the box, they discovered the body of a young girl um, on, an, on its way to Edinburgh. That was the address that was on it, it was on its way to Edinburgh. This was the time of the body snatchers and um, it was thought that Newcastle was on the route for the body snatchers, body snatchers to, to send bodies up to, to Edinburgh um, to be dissected. Now, Newcastle breweries, of course, is it, the beer I think that uh, is most known for in, in Newcastle. This in the 1770s, John Barris he started a brewery in Gateshead, and this was leased to Charles Reed in 1861. Charles Reed had married into the family, and he bought the pubs in 1882. Um, Reed moved across the river, and he bought the Tyne Brewery. Um, this is the Tyne Brewery as it was, with the blue star as their emblem. Um, they had a virtual monopoly of pubs on Tyneside. This was Newcastle Breweries because this is when 1889 um, Newcastle Breweries was established. They had a virtual monopoly on pubs in Tyneside, um, but the government decided that other uh, beer pro providers should be allowed and Newcastle Breweries had to give up some of their pubs. Now today, there are approximately 265 pubs in Newcastle but there are many more places where alcohol can be bought, such as hotels, restaurants, off beer licenses, uh, to name but a few. So there are lots of places where we can we can buy uh, beer. So beer, well, drink. This is a an old uh, this is an old drawing of people in um, in the 18th century waiting outside of a pub for it to open. And here's another one. There's another one. This is Drinkers on the Streets of Newcastle. Uh, scenes of drunkenness uh, are depicted in, in this particular sketch. You can see at the bottom right hand corner people in the streets. Now, drink was an important part of life on Tyneside. Um, it was higher, drinking was higher than the national average, and it's still true today. In 1854, uh, statistics show that it, there was one pub for every 22 families in the suburbs. Newcastle and Northumberland were top of the league for drunk convictions. Um, upper classes they drank wine, lower classes drank beer, even children drank beer. Well it was safer than drinking the water at that time because mainly the cholera epidemics from 1830s to the 1850s. It was common for a working man to drink seven to eight pints of beer a day. And it was commented that the lower classes were drinking themselves to death. In London, 
um, there was a sign said uh, you could get drunk for a penny and dead drunk for tuppence. Then, of course, there was gin, mother's ruin. There were gin houses as well. The government was so worried that uh, about the effects of people drinking gin, they put a hefty tax of 20 shillings a gallon on it. Everybody got drunk. Everyone drank. Ladies got drunk. Clergymen as well got drunk. If you left a gentleman's table sober, it was a slight on the host. So if you went for, you know, to your friends for dinner and you left sober, it was certainly an insult. I'm going to read you something now. This is something from, this is a quote from the Reverend J.C. Street. He was a temperance advocate. He visited Newcastle in 1865. And this is just a little bit of what he found. He's, this is in the Quayside area of Newcastle. He said, our steps were next turned to a place well known to the police here. Narrow, steep and dirty bank. It was crowded with people. Men and women were sitting on the floor of the street getting the air. But the air was so vicious and noxious that the less they got of it, the better. Refuse of the houses was thrown into the streets and we were compelled to pick our way. Here were little dirty shops choked with a perfect medley of things, public houses and beer shops full to overflowing with tipplers. Girls and women standing at the doors of many of them acting as lures to youths and men. Out of these public houses, men and women were coming drunk and incapable. Here, a husband was remonstrating with a drunken wife. There, a wife or daughter or friend were trying to persuade drunken man to go home, while in another place a crew of them were laughing, swearing and blaspheming together. It was a sort of pandemonium. So that just gives you an idea of what life was like on the streets of Newcastle in the middle of the uh, 19th century. And I know some of you will say, well, it could perhaps be a bit like that, a bit like that today. Um, the big market, there were lots of pubs in the big market, something like 20 uh, 22 pubs in total, 20 licensed premises. Uh, pubs were situated near uh, markets to cater for the market traders and par for shoppers as well. Now, one of the pubs here in the big market was this pub. This is the Beehive Hotel. Um, this is at least the second Beehive pub on this particular site. Um, it was rebuilt in 1902 by Oswald uh, and Sons for Newcastle Breweries. And they tended to use a lot of these beautiful tiles. I've got a, another picture of the outside here of, of the tiles. And if you go past the beehive, have a look at it. And you can see little beehives and bees um, on the tiles. It is, the outside of this building it is listed. Um, the tiles were made in Leeds are called Vermintoft tiles. Very popular. You'll find them in other places in Newcastle in the Central Arcade. You also see tiles there as well. But it was here on this site that um, there was another pub called Pinkney's Ale House. And it was there's a story uh, surrounding Pink, Pinkney's Ale House. Ewan MacDonald, he was a he was a Scottish soldier. He was here in Newcastle and he was enjoying a pint of beer. And he got into a row um, at Pinkney's Ale House. This row spilled out into the big market and Ewan stabbed his, his opponent with a knife and killed him. Now, this was 1752. And um, in 1752, an act of parliament was passed saying that it hanged murderers, uh, their bodies could be handed over to the barber surgeons. So Ewan was taken, he was found guilty of murder and he was sentenced to be hanged, and he was hanged on the, on the town moor. Um, if you're wondering where it was, it was here. This is the Blood Donor Centre on Barrack Road. It was on the car park um, that, that he was hanged. And because of this new Act of Parliament that was passed, he, uh, his body was handed over to the barber surgeons. Um, this is the barber surgeons hall. And uh, this is before the medical school started. So the surgeons themselves had to learn how to be surgeons. And the only way they could do that was by dissecting bodies. There were very few and far between. Hence the reason why 
they had the um, um, Birkin hair and had the body snatches. They were trying to get as many bodies as possible for the different medical schools and barber surgeons uh, throughout throughout the country. Um, surgeons were the lowest form of doctor. They weren't allowed to call themselves a doctor. They were known as Mr which is why today when a surgeon becomes a consultant, he reverts to the title of, of Mr. So they brought Ewan McDonald's uh, body down here. They laid him out on the slab. They were absolutely thrilled to bits to have a nice fresh body to, to dissect. And they left him there overnight in charge of a young, a young trainee surgeon. Um, and while, while it, got everything ready for, for the dissection the next day. So when he had his back turned to the body, he heard a noise and he turned around and Ewan sat up. He wasn't dead. He was still alive. Well, this trainee surgeon thought, well, what can I do here? He says, if I let him go, another barber surgeon throughout the country will get him. Um, you know, they'll find, they'll arrest him, he'd be hanged again. He says, so we can't be having that. So he picks up a mallet and he hits him over the head with it and kills him. Well, you can't be you can't be arrested for killing somebody who's supposedly already dead. He was absolutely delighted he'd saved this body for Newcastle. He bragged to everybody, his friends, his colleagues, you name it, he told them all about it. And it wasn't until a few weeks later, as he was leaving the barber surgeons, a, a horse came galloping past, knocked him over, and he, he was killed himself. Now, many of the people in Newcastle were extremely um, superstitious, and they said it was the spirit of Ewan had got into the horse, and it wreaked its revenge on the young trainee surgeon uh, for, for stopping him from uh, escaping from the barber surgeon's hall. Uh, another old pub is the Black Boy. Um, this is, or the Blackie Boy, it's often known as. It was originally built in the early 18th century on the site of a former blacksmith's. Um, an ale was sold from a makeshift um, taproom in the backyard, hence the name the Black Boy from the blacksmith's. It was rebuilt in 1889. Uh, it was the favourite haunt of Thomas Buick and the home of a debating club called Swarley's. And they met in the late 18th century. And I've got a, a picture here. Here it is. This is Swarley's with, with people like Thomas Buick um, enjoying themselves. This is a, a watercolour by Robert Embleton. Members had to behave themselves. They had to act as true gentlemen or they would have been dismissed. Uh, the gentleman uh, on the right is actually um, was actually Mr. S Mr. Swarley. Women weren't allowed. They would have come. It was a debating. It was a place where people could come and meet and talk. And as I say, women certainly weren't allowed. But this is one place women were uh, allowed. And this is the Flying Horse. Now, this was a notorious pub in the uh, 19th century. And it had a room called Hell's Kitchen, which was um, occupied by various well-known Newcastle eccentrics, rough lower class women, tramps, ruffians and low life are said to, uh, to come into to Hell's Kitchen. Um, these people were all well known on the streets um, and uh, of the, uh, not just Newcastle, but down by the quayside as well. And there's another painting here. This is by... Uh, Henry Purley Parker, this is 1817 of Hell's Kitchen. And these are some of the people who would uh, frequent uh, Hell's Kitchen in, in the Flying Horse. Uh, we've got Owl Judy, as you can see at the front. She was a keeper of the town hutch. The town hutch was where the town kept its money. And that was in the Guild Hall, downstairs in the Guild Hall. Um, and she would uh, she guard it with her life. Blind Willie Purvis is also here. He he's well known in Newcastle uh, as a performer as well. Uh, the landlord, who was Ralph Nicholson, he ruled them with a rod of iron. He banned anyone 
who breached the rules of etiquette. So everybody, even though they were a bit rough and ready, they had to behave themselves. There was a poker for the fire and he had to keep it chained to the wall. And this was to stop it being used by the patrons. Um, the flying horse, while well, that was demolished in the 20th century for the building of Thompson House and Thompson House is currently being demolished. And I think the archae uh, archaeologists are going to go in and see what's underneath. So they may watch this space. They may just find some interesting things when they when they pull down um, Thompson House. Another old pub, Duke of Wellington. Um, this was known as Stokes originally after the brewer who, who owned it. Um, it became famous for one of the landlords in 1878. His, his name was William Campbell, who was a Scotsman. And uh, he was the heaviest man in the country. This is him. Um, he was 53 stone or 337 kilos, depending on, on how you want to look at it. He was tall. He was six foot four, but he had a 76 inch chest. And he died in 1878. He was only 22. He didn't have an enormous appetite, it was said, but probably because he was the landlord of a pub, he, he probably enjoyed his ale and his beer that he, he drank, and that would have been adding to it to his weight. He died in his room uh, upon the third floor. The drawing, you can see in the middle, um, the the coffin being lowered. They had to move part of the, win uh, the window um, of his room um, to get the coffin in and out. And... Uh, then they had to winch it down. Um, it was too heavy for a hearse, so it had to go on a brewer's dray. And uh, 40,000 people lined uh, the funeral pre uh, procession. And he was buried up at Jesmond Old Cemetery, uh, where lots of people were, were trying to see, to see the funeral. So much so, they were jostling around the grave, and many people were falling into the grave and had to scramble out before... Poor old uh, William Campbell managed still to be, to be buried. Now, this is a, a pub. I, I like this pub. This is a, a really interesting pub. This is the Crown Posada. It was built as the Crown. Um, commonly thought to have the name change for Crown Posada uh, when it was owned by a sea captain uh, who brought his mistress from, spray, uh, from Spain to run it. That's, that's one of the reasons we think it could have been called that. Posada is, is, a, is a word, a Spanish word, meaning an inn or a meeting place. Um, but uh, another possible reason could uh, come because two of the consulates of Spain and of Mexico were very nearby. And the employees are thought to have met in the crown as well hence the name. So they were all Spanish speaking. So that could also be one of the reasons why it's called the Posada. Now, several years ago, uh, the manager was asked why it was so popular, because it is, it's even today, it's still a very popular pub. And he says, well, its popularity is due to many things. It doesn't have a pool table. It doesn't have slot machines, a TV, a jukebox, a dartboard, children or dogs. Um, it's a place for people to go and meet and chat, and he says that's added to its uh, added to its popularity. Moving on to hotels, which had now this is a Grand Hotel on the left and the right. Um, this is a Grand Hotel up by the Haymarket. James Duker um, built the, the Grand Hotel. This was in 1890. It cost us £60,000. Very nice hotel. First class. It had 50 bedrooms, but it also had public lounges and uh, also other public rooms where you could go in and get a drink. Uh, the uh, Temperance Witness magazine, they weren't very happy about this opening. They claimed that uh, the licensing authorities had, and I'll quote here, insulted the Christian and moral feelings of the citizens by sanctioning the building of the Grand. Um, they certainly didn't want it. They thought it was far too big and it would just make people want to, to drink more. It was eventually taken over by Newcastle Breweries in 1956 and two years later eventually sold to King's College, which became Newcastle University in 1958. 
um, by compulsory purchase at a cost of 77,000. 500 and that picture on the right you can see is is all part of the university buildings as it now is but next to it stands another pub the crow's nest and this is how the crow's nest used to look it was a uh in, in the beginning of the 19th century um it looked like a country cottage it had a red tiled roof it had ash and elm trees outside uh which housed a colony of rooks um, but by 1860, the birds had moved out when all but one tree was felled. So this is the photograph here. You can see there's only one tree left. Um, the last tree was eventually felled in 1889. Altered in 1896 and taken over by Newcastle Breweries. Um, and its name changed many times. Um, it was renamed Inventions. This was in 1987 and Bar Oz. But in 2005, it changed its name back to what it should have been, which is the crow's nest. And this is it here. And that stands right next door to what was the Grand the grand Hotel. Now, I don't know if you've been in this bar. Um, it's called the Market Lane, but most people know it as, as the Monkey Bar. Um, the Market Lane stood on the corner of a lane which ran down to... Uh, a, a butcher market, which was built in 1808. This was a huge market which stretched from Pilgrim Street, which is where the market lane is, um, to the cloth market and from Mosley Street right up to Highbridge. It was a huge market, but it was demolished in the 1830s to make way for Granger's Newcastle. He wanted to build on that site uh, for his, uh, the Granger developments. But the name lives on in the name of the street, the street that runs down the side of the Market Lane pub uh, and also the name of the pub. That just says that there was a market at that point. Um, it was a popular watering hole for Irish bricklayers working on the buildings of um, Newcastle and those building the Tyne Bridge. So they would often leave the hods um, or monkeys, as, the, as they were known, in the passageway of the pub as security um, against paying their bar bill. So that's where we get the, the monkey bar from. Um, the pub was given a new look in 2019 and included a monkey, as you can see in the top picture. On, on the fascia, they put a monkey. And also inside, there are monkey prints. And also on the light fittings, there are monkeys. So still known, still known as... Uh, the monkey bar. Rosie's, this is on Stour Street. This is a, a very popular bar, very close to um, St. James's Park. It's got uh, lots of uh, 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 Newcastle United memorabilia in. But why is it called Rosie's? Well, it was named for Rosie O'Shea. She uh, was born in 1851 in Ireland. She was sent to England with her aunt and uncle for a better life. They lived on, on the quayside. Now, a local man, uh, a rather unscrupulous character called Mr. Alexander, he, um, he took a shine to Rosie and he bought a tavern for her where the present bar stands today. Now, she became a singer and an entertainer. She had a really good voice and would often... Uh, would often sing here. Mr. Alexander, though, as I say, was an unscrupulous character. Um, he was stabbed to death for his money. And this upset Rosie considerably. She must have been very much in love with him, which meant that she became depressed and she disappeared from Newcastle and nobody knew where she went. However, five years later, um, an Irish immigrant was uh, passing through Ellis Island in New York. He was on his way, he wanted to emigrate, and he heard a familiar voice. And he thought, I know that voice. And when he looked, he saw Rosie standing on a trunk and she was singing to the, the waiting queues, waiting to go through. He tried to reach her, uh, but was knocked over in the crush. And when he recovered, Rosie had vanished and she was never seen again. But her name lives on, lives on in the, the bar on Stour Street. And this is, uh, has been rebuilt, um, rebuilt 
uh, on Stella Street. Another bar relating to um, Newcastle United is the Strawberry opposite, opposite St James's Park. Um, the area uh, belonged to, was belonging to the, the nuns of St Bartholomew. They tended strawberry gardens in the area and it's, they're said to have made strawberry wine uh, with the berries. However, the, uh, the Bishop of Durham threatened to excommunicate them for, for making this wine. Uh, this is a mid 19th century pub. It's, uh, the upper floor was a residence. I don't know if it's still a residence today. But during the time when Alan Pardew was manager, he, he brought over four, four French players. For, uh, he signed four players from France. And so the pub decided to rechristen it La Fraise. And you can see the picture here. And uh, that and that was that was uh, up for quite some time. Uh, now, I do guided tours. As, uh, I know many of you know this. I do guided tours in Newcastle. And several years ago, um, I had a group and I was I brought them up and I was talking to them opposite the strawberry. We were talking about uh, the strawberry and what the area used to be. It was Sunday afternoon. Uh, it was a lovely afternoon, um, but there was a match going to be held. And uh, as we were standing and I was talking, lots and lots of fans came past us, all in their black and white, streaming up to to um, come to St. James's Park. Now, when they saw us, they surrounded us. Now, this was a time when they were hoping to build St. James's Park on Lees's Park. And they thought we were part of the uh, the people who didn't want to have who who uh, didn't want it to be built. So they surrounded us and they started a chant, and they called us anoraks and they were chanting anoraks anoraks. Now most people in my group that I had were were um, you know a, an older age group. Some of them were elderly, and I was a bit concerned about them. And I was trying to explain. I says, look. We are no, we are not here. We're nothing to do with uh, the the issues about building St James's Park on the moor. Uh, so I managed to get them away, and I took them up St James's Street. And when I got the group safely out of the way, I said to them, "Hey, I must apologise. Um, you know, if I'd known it was going to be like that, I certainly wouldn't have stopped there." And one elderly lady says, "E purchases." I wouldn't, she says, you don't have to apologise to me. She says, I've never had so much fun on a Sunday afternoon that I've had for years. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's my story about something that happened during the time of uh, rebuilding St. James's Park. Uh, the Cooperage, <coughs> um, sadly closed. It's got scaffolding up at the minute. Um didn't start life as a pub, it started as a cooperage, uh, a place for making barrels right up until 1974. It is old, the, the lower portion is medieval, the upper portion is a bit later, um, but it is a, a beautiful old old building. And after the Coopers, uh, which were um, at the Cooperage moved out, the actual Coopers business moved out, they moved up, up the West End. Um, this was turned into a pub and a restaurant. There were ghosts in here. It was rather a spooky place. Um, one of the most ghostly pubs in Newcastle. Um, when the, uh, the staff were clearing up and setting the, the restaurant out for the next day, they said they'd seen strange things. They'd seen huge balls of smoke coming towards them. They'd seen a young girl dressed in Victorian clothes going into the toilet. And when they followed her, she disappeared. They'd also seen a man who was there quite often doffing his cap. How often do you see men, men doffing their cap these days? And he would often disappear. Um, sadly, it's closed. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to it. I know there are um, a lot of people concerned about it. It's a, a building at risk. So let's hope that they're going to actually do something and turn it into to something uh, something quite soon before it falls down. Now, Pumphreys, this is on the cloth market. This is another one, another building that didn't start life as a pub. 
Um, the business started in 17, um, 1750, and it was then owned by a man called Lee Smith, um, and it was sold to George, Richard, uh, George Richardson. He was a Quaker uh, and a tanner and also a tea dealer. Um, he took in his, his great nephew, Thomas Pumphrey. He joined the family firm. Um, and it's been known as Pumphrey's ever since. Um, Thomas Pumphrey, he built, rebuilt the cloth market premises to, to the building you see today. In 1870, and Pumphrey's Coffee became a household name in the Northeast. Um, he was also a Quaker and a temperance advocate. And he was really concerned about the amount of drinking that was happening in the 19th century in Newcastle. So he opened above his, of his shop, he opened a coffee bar where you could go and get a, a drink of coffee. Uh, and that he encouraged people to drink coffee instead of alcohol. And it was open for many years, right until 1983, when the business was purchased by a Mr. C.J. Archer and a new factory was built in Bladen. But they retained, I'm so pleased, they retained the Pumphrey name. Pumphrey's you can still buy in Newcastle in the Granger Market. There's a little shop. I go in there and I buy my loose tea. I like tea from, from Pumphrey. So you can even get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea in, in the Granger Market as well. Um, it was turned into a pub. So what Mr Pumphrey would have thought, I'm sure he must have turned in his grave when he realised that his um, that his coffee shop was being turned into a pub. It was known as Rick's for many years. And then in 2020, this is last year, these two gentlemen you can see on the picture, um, this uh, £150,000 was spent on it. Uh, the two gentlemen, Tommy Byron and Rob Clarkson, they turned it into a blues cafe. So I'm sure they're absolutely desperate for it to, re to be open because I don't think it's had a proper, a proper time during this pandemic when it has been open properly. Um, lots of music upstairs, uh, and let's hope and let's hope they'll be able to to open it soon. Now, the last thing I want to talk about are Barnbury's. Um It was a pub. It started life as the Wheat Chief, um, but of course, most people know it because it was a music hall. Now, music hall was one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the Victorian period. Um, and music halls can be traced back to the taverns and the coffee houses of 18th century London. And it was really where men met, eat, drink and do business. Um, performers in London sang songs while the audience ate, drank and joined in the, and joined in the singing. By the 1830s, the taverns had room devoted uh, to musical clubs um, they presented like Saturday evening sing songs and free and easies. I think up here we call it something else. We call it go as you please. Uh, it's where amateur singers did turns to a piano accompaniment. And they became so popular um, that entertainment was put on two or three times a week. In Newcastle, uh, songs were beginning to emerge in Newcastle. These were reflecting the unique Geordie humour and, and life of, of the area. Um, so prior to the 1850s in the back rooms of public houses, customers would often provide their own entertainment by singing, but enterprising uh, publicans, they recognised the, uh, the potential for increase in business and so they paid for professional entertainers and so the music hall as we know it in Newcastle was born. And this was embraced uh, by the massive um, working class people who were searching for something to escape the hardships of life. Um, I'm going to talk about two or three people who came and performed here in, in Barnborough's. Um, it wasn't the, uh, it was the most famous music hall in Newcastle, it wasn't the only one, as I say, it was known as the Wheat Chief. Uh, John Bamber was the landlord between 1840 to 1865, and it was known as the Oxford Music Hall then. Um, now, one person that performed here was this gentleman, Joe Wilson. He he was born on Stowell Street, there's a, a blue plaque to him on, on the corner of Stowell Street. He became a printer, but he also wrote songs and he sang, um, in an amateur way, 
But in 1864, he appeared at the Oxford Music Hall, Bambras, and within a year, uh, he was only 24, he became the undisputed Northeast Concert Hall superstar. Uh, he was given the accolade, the Bard of Tyneside. Um, I think one of his most famous songs was Keep Your Feet Still, Geordie Hinney, which you'll still find lots of people have recorded it um, on, on old 78 records. So the, the song itself is still still going today. So that's Joe Wilson. Um, another person that performed here was this man. This is George Leibon. Now, he was born in Gateshead in 1842 and he spent his childhood in Sheffield where um, within a, like a musical environment um, he was greatly inf influenced by his aunt who uh, was a professional singer and was a leading soprano at St Nicholas. Um, she helped George um, develop his baritone voice and his wonderful stage presence. Um, then the family moved to London in 1866, he wrote a very famous song called Champagne Charlie. Um, it was a household name uh, because of this song. And uh, he sang this and it became an immediate hit, the Champagne Charlie. He, he appeared on stage countrywide. He was dressed as a debonair man about town and with uh, to perform the number. Because of his strict upbringing, uh, when he played the halls around Newcastle, he changed his name. He, he was known as Joe Saunders so that his family didn't know he was on the stage, which would have been a scandal. Um, in London, he was employed at uh, at the Canterbury Hall, which was the, uh, the first purpose-built music hall in London. He was paid £30 a week. And he got sponsorship from champagne shippers. People like Moe Chandon uh, also gave him money. And when William Holland became manager, he gave him a, a carriage drawn with four white horses and told him they should only drink champagne in public. So over the next year, his salary rose to £120 a week, which was a lot of money in, in the 1860s. And he would be um, often seen going round town in his carriage with his horses, swigging champagne, um, uh, declaring his love for the high life and women, well, women loved him and men, they they liked his cavalier attitude to life. He wrote also The Daring Young Man on the Flying Trapeze. That was another of his songs. However, it wasn't a happy ending for him. After having he, he consuming vast quantities of champagne, he died of liver failure in Islington at age only 42. So he had a very short life. You'll find many of these um, musical singers had very short lives and died of um, one disease or affliction uh, for another. Now, the last one I'm going to talk about is Geordie Ridley. We can't talk about Bambras without talking about Geordie Ridley. Geordie Ridley was a born in Gateshead, 1835. Um, worked down the pit from the age of eight and he worked for Hawks Crochet in Gateshead as a wagon rider, but he suffered an accident which stopped him from working. He was a singer of comic songs and he wrote his own, but not the music. He used music from other songs and uh, he went on the halls to sing it. Um, the songs were all about real people and events. Um, he wrote The Bladen Races in 1862, uh, which was sung four days before a benefit con for, uh, concert for Harry Clasper, the most important ro ro oarsman of, it, of his date. And this was sung four days before The Bladen Races. Um, he also wrote um, another song called Cushy Butterfield. Now, Cushy, she was also a real character. Um, she wasn't pleased to have a song uh, written about her, well, would you? Because in the song it said she was like a sack full of sawdust tied around with a string. Um, and she and her cousin, Tom Gray the Muckman, who's also mentioned in the song, chased Geordie all the way around the Granger Market to try and stop him from singing, from singing this song. Now, what I'm going to do is, here it is. This is, oh, this is the, uh, in 1962, they reopened as as the uh, 
as Bambras and they tried to have music hall. I can remember going um, in the 60s, you got a uh, stotty sandwiches with ham and peas pudding, of course, and they had uh, turns on the stage. It was very, very popular at that particular time. What I want to do is we're going to sing the Blade and Races. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye